I'm honored by the invitation to speak in this company, and I'm glad to talk about the great talk. I happen to have been working on a book project for the last two or three years, and it's finally done, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce it to such an audience. Um, So this is the great talk, in case someone is wondering. It's, it's a tall, it was a tall bird, uh, about 80 centimeters, six kilos. And uh, these are the themes of my talk. Um, I want to say something about the species itself and the careful books of 1858 documents about the last hunting expeditions uh, written by a British bird and egg collector, John Wally, and secondly, his friend Alfred Newton, who traveled with him to Iceland, who uh, theorized extinction in the wake of the Iceland expedition of 1858, and finally, I want to reflect a bit on, on extinction for the modern age of the Anthropocene, the age in which we live when humans increasingly affect uh, life on, on the planet. So extinction. A popular dictionary on many Apple computers has this definition of extinction. Noun the state or process of being or becoming extinct. The extinction of the great dog is in the de definition itself. For a century and a half, the great dog, Alca impennis, indeed has served as one of the key examples of species extinction, if not the example. The flightless great, bird, or great dog apparently became extinct on Elte, southwest Iceland, by the middle of the 19th century. The last pair were captured at the beginning of June in 1944. The bird's organs were stored in alcohol in several jars, which can still be seen in the Zoological Museum in Copenhagen, where they continue to receive attention. There are, in fact, 10 or 11 jars in the museum with the intestines of the last two members of the great dog species. In fact, there is a rich literature on the specimens and the species. I shall try to explain why this is the case, arguing that the, fate, that the sad fate of the great dog now deserves even more attention than in the past. For one thing, its last moments were carefully documented by two British naturalists and bird enthusiasts, John Wally to the left, and Alfred Newton, who visited Iceland in the summer of 1858, 14 years after the apparent disappearance of the species. So far, these manuscripts have received scant attention, although they have often been cited. Once I learned about them, I took it as my task to dive into them, and it was not an easy task, uh, given the scale and, and the handwriting. Secondly, the realization of the advancing extinction of the species marked the birth of extinction as an epistemic object, nothing less. Uh, sadly, John Wally uh, died a year after the Icelandic expedition, probably from brain tumor. Alfred Newton, on the other hand, became the first professor of zoology at Cambridge University and a pioneer of extinction talk. I'll dwell on that a bit. It is now time, I think, to both acknowledge Newton's contribution and to think beyond it. The age of the Anthropocene, the period of escalating human impact on the planet, demands rethinking of extinction, moving beyond Newton's understanding. During the last two years, mass protests under the banner of Extinction Rebellion have shaken many cities. I'm sure you know the logo. It's a powerful logo. It symbolizes the world, time, 
and, and some other things. A report by the United Nations earlier this year, and uh, here is uh, an image from uh, one of the demonstrations in, in London this year, I think. Uh, many of the events had the banner, there is no plan B, and you probably understand. A report by the United Nations earlier this year, one million threatened species, suggests that discussions of the current environmental crisis should not focus only on global warming. Reduced biological diversity is a growing and serious threat. A new wave of extinction, apparently the sixth in the history of Earth, and the only one driven by humans, is already on course. These are mass extinction events, eliminating, as the definition specifies, and I quote, a significant proportion of the world's biota in a geologically insignificant amount of time. So things are happening fast and on a grand scale. If a million species is about to disappear, a significant part of the total number of known species, the entire habitat of the planet will face irreparable damage. Clearly, we need to critically reflect on extinction, including its awkward origins. The great orc had many names, partly because of classificatory confusion. Sometimes it was referred to as penguin, pengoin, or penguin, in Dutch, French, and English, respectively, although it was unrelated to so-called penguins. When European travelers encountered flightless birds in the southern hemisphere resembling the great auk, they would name them penguin, and the name stuck. The great auk, in other words, was the original penguin. One of the oldest images was a painting by Nicholas Robert, made at the French court in Versailles in the late 17th century. A better known and a little older work is a drawing by Ole Worm here in Copenhagen, who kept a living bird from the Faroe Islands. It's, a, it's been an iconic image. Uh, the bird had become a museum piece. This was the age of the Wunderkammer, and here is Ole Worms. I tried to see it twice, and it's always closed. It's, it's, it's a bit sad. Uh, what, you may ask, made the great talk and the origin of extinction awkward? It seems plausible that the English name of the bird was derived from its low and clumsy call, orc. In any case, sometime in the Middle Ages, the word orc became the root of awkward, neither upward nor downward, but sideways, meaning strange or against the current, equivalent to over in Icelandic or Old Norse. Perhaps medieval people who had some experience of great orcs saw some association between the whacking, flightless bird and awkwardness. Great orcs were social animals. In early summer, the parents would breed on islands and skerries in small colonies among other, other bird species. The pair would lay one large egg, about 12 times 8 centimeters, incubating on shifts for about six weeks. After five days or so, the chicks would throw themselves into the sea. The scaries were not selected at random. Here, breeding birds would be safe from predators for millennia, although both Neanderthals and early humans would hunt for them. Paintings show great orcs have been discovered in European caves from 35,000 years ago. Archaeological research has demonstrated great orc bones in sites in North America, Iceland, the British Isles, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and Denmark, testifying to a long history of human exploitation throughout the North Atlantic. Early in the 16th century, Europeans received news of big colonies of great orcs in Newfoundland. These colonies were hunted down in one century or so by seafarers from France and Portugal. The vulnerable birds were herded in great numbers and clubbed down. Once the fishermen had stacked their schooners with salted great orc meat, they sailed away. 
The shipment would suffice for a whole crew on the way back to, hum to ho home to, Euro to Europe. The Great Orc, in other words, drove European exploits in the New World, which in turn drove the Great Orc further down the road to extinction. Later on, when European collectors busily competed for rare birds, skins and eggs, the small colonies in Iceland, the British Isles and elsewhere in Europe began to collapse. It was time to pay attention to its fate. Victorian Britain was particularly attentive. The last days of the Great Orc are fairly well known, thanks to the Icelandic expedition of John Wallay and the Gerfoul books, Gerfoul books he wrote during the trip. Located in Cambridge University Library, the Gerfoul books, about 900 handwritten pages in five volumes, represent an underexploited source offering a rare window into the perspectives of the last crews which hunted for them under growing international pressures for museum specimens. Wally and his friend and travel companion, Alfred Newton, no relation to the more famous Isaac Newton, hoped to see some great orcs, unaware of the fact that the species had became, become extinct. They planned a trip to Elde, south of Iceland, south of Reykjanes Peninsula, at the last breeding, known breeding ground of the great dog, hoping to study its behavior and habits and perhaps buy a stuffed bird. When Wally and Newton left Victorian England in the spring of 1858 to look for great dogs in Iceland, one of their friends teased them that this was a genuinely awkward expedition, awkward in many ways. The weather did not permit sailing to the islands on an open rowing boat. They settled instead for two months with a local fisherman, Wilhelm Haukonason, at a place called Kirkjuvogur. Kirkjuvogur. This is how, how it stands today. Uh, some of the ruins from the old houses, I imagine, are there. They had a good map of the southwest coast and nearby skerries and islands, a beautiful map, and they called it wonderful. And uh, it was done by Gunnlaugsson, who was trained in mathematics in Copenhagen. So it was uh, ahead of its time in many ways. Here is the Southwest Peninsula, the international airport of Keflavik, and Kirkjuvo is exactly here, the place where they settled for two months, and Elde, which they were looking for, is probably here. And uh, here is the Westman Isles, where I was born and raised. And you know the rest. To compensate for the lack of direct experience, they interviewed fishermen who had been on the last expedition, establishing a list of the last crew of 1844. And here is the list they came up with. They, it took a while to uh, interview and to finalize the the list, uh, memories were different, and, and this is for 15 years, 14 years after the last expedition. Anyway, 12 of the 14 sailors were still alive. The Brits became ethnographers, drawing up kinship diagrams and tapping the cognitive worlds of their informants, their witnesses, as they called them. And here is and what struck me with these manuscripts was partly it's kind of anthropologists at work at the time. They uh, repeatedly talk to people, they seriously interview them, and they insist upon knowing how they relate to each other. And uh, here is their host, Wilhelmur, our host, 1858, and his wife, Thora, and uh, daughters, Steinen and Anna, aged 16 and 6. Anna reads well, and this one does, uh, does the honors of our table, British style. And, and here is uh, an interesting document. They're trying to track the last expeditions, uh, starting with, there are more upstairs, so to speak. 
starting with 1842, and some of the uh, guys went later on, 1857, they exchanged letters after the expedition, but did not, catch, did not land or they didn't catch anything. So, here's an interesting image. John Wally received some letter through Reykjavik while he is in, in the field. John Wally, Esquire, hunting Geirfugl, Reykjavik, Eller Keflavik. And clearly, he got the letter despite everything. It wouldn't work today. Uh, they had a local informant, Geir Soeka, who, uh, this is a drawing by, by another traveler, who became uh, one of the best known Icelandic entrepreneurs in the 19th century. He followed them around and, and interviewed and translated for them. Although both Wally and Newton had some rudimentary knowledge in Danish. Most available images of the bird at the time were based on second-hand observations. Uh, how would Icelanders describe it? Its colors, character and behavior. How were expeditions organized? What was the history of the great dog, of great dog hunting? What happened to the skins and the bodies? And these were some of the questions they, they raised. Uh, the key source at the time was Japetus Stenstrup's Be dragged till Geirfuglen's Natur History or Serli till Kunskaben om den stillere Ubreningskreis, published the previous year. So they knew a lot, but still, this was literary evidence, not the evidence of, of the hunters. Much detail, however, was shrouded in mystery. A little later, Aaron from Tangek in West Greenland painted a striking aquarelle based on his own experience of hunting. I think it's quite unlikely that Newton and Wolle saw this image. This is painted in, in Nuuk or, or nearby and, and probably never traveled to, to either England or, or Europe. And uh, I'm sure you, most of you know about Aaron. Uh, I guess he's the most famous painter of Greenland. And uh, he used to hunt for great oaks, but this is painted a few years after the extinction. Normally, according to uh, Wallace's witnesses, the birds are killed, were killed instantly for their meat, feathers, or bodies. Rarely did they describe human birth encounters outside of the killing zone. This was definitely not what is now called multi-species ethnography, and which is now in fashion. Once, however, a seaman observed in Wallace's account, when, when we came about half a mile from Skagen, this is not Skagen, he saw the bird, and the bird followed them for a mile. Witness is sure the bird would not see them. He cannot understand why the bird followed them. It was calm, good weather. The bird did not call, thick beak. He was sometimes up and at times diving. So there is some description of a of, of, uh, living bird. Clearly the bird was curious, trying to say, make sense of the humans. A similar behavior has been observed for crows in a recent uh, book uh, documented by Tom van Doren, which an anthropologist, philosopher, which I have something to say about. On another occasion, fish, a fisherman brought a living bird to land, like Ule Worm in his Unterkammer, then carried it on a horse to the local trader, Danish trader in Keflavik, now the place of an international airport, hoping to sell it alive to Copenhagen. This must have been a tragic comic scene. The bird remained silent during the ride under the arm of its owner. Its beak was tied up and it swung its head back and forth in protest. During the last hunting expedition, foreman Wilhelm Haukonason, the key guy, uh, sent three of his crew to the so-called underland of Elde, where the birds were breeding. And this is the key site, Elde. Uh, beautiful image taken by a friend of mine, Ragnar Sigurdsson, 
you can see Snæfell circle uh, across the bay, and and this here is the uh, the underland, as the fishermen called it, or the platform. Uh, this is the place where the great oak last, uh, the last ones who were seen uh, would uh, uh, lay the wreck. And uh, you can imagine the difficulties of, of uh, landing with an open rowing boat uh, in, in heavy water. It was risky business. One of the crew, Ketil Ketilsson, told Volley a dramatic story of the encounter. And here is a guy, a local peasant. Part of it has been widely circulated in great oak literature. In Volley's wording, and, and here is uh, more or less the text from the uh, great Gerfaul books. Uh, Ketill, Sigurður and Jón Brandsson landed. The former two ran after one of the birds. But as they got near the edge, Ketill had failed him and he stopped. Sigurður went on and seized the bird. My informant, torn as he was throughout the chase, went to look at the place from which the bird had started. And there he saw an egg lying on the lava stab which he took up. It was cracked or broken. Ketit laid it down again where he had found it. This account is sometimes exaggerated in, in the literature, and some recent commentators suggest that Ketit deliberately crushed the egg, destroying the last opportunity for a great dog to come to life. And the last egg has become a kind of symbol for, for extinction. While they waited and had interviews, they, they would walk around and look for towards Elde. The plan was to land here and, and collect some birds and eggs, but they never got out. But this is one drawing. They built a cairn here. I still have to check where it still stands. It would be fun to know. Was there any reason to worry about the species? Was the apparent decline of the great oak simply migration to other skerries where the birds would not be dis disturbed, as some Icelanders would say at the time? Extinction was not yet on the agenda. Wolle and Newton planned a major book, a treatise on the great oak, based on their Icelandic expedition, but for various reasons this did not materialize. A relatively obscure figure, however, the Scotsman Symington Grieve, stole the scene in 1885 with his The Great Oak or Gerfaul, uh, recently, recently republished in England. An impressive book. Other major works are by Errol Fuller, The Great Oak from 1999, and Jeremy Gaskell's who Killed the Great Oak from 2000. These are excellent works. Uh, these excellent works testify to the continued interest in the species. Uh, uh, Errol Fuller must count as uh, uh, one of the key uh, Great Oak scholars of the time. He uh, lives in uh, southern England and I visited him uh, uh, last year and, and, and shot this photo. Here he is. Uh, with his great oak egg. He had two great oak eggs, which are quite valuable. And once he had even a stuffed great oak, which is even more valuable, but was forced to sell it. And his house is kind of uh, warmy and wunderkammer, full of stuff from Vic the Victorian age, and amazing stuff. But he writes, uh, he wrote a huge book on the great oak literature, and. And recently, he co-authored a book on, uh, on birds with uh, Richard uh, Attenborough. So, let's move back in time and to the broader picture. 
the birth of extinction. For long, Western ideas from Aristotle onward tended to assume that nothing in nature was without justification. Nothing would disappear, least of all humans, unless it was obviously devoid of purpose. Western thought took for granted that justice and all the hallmarks of civilization were ingrained in the natural world. As a result, extinction was unthinkable. The idea itself was practically non-existent until the 18th century. It was Englishman John Ray who first coined the term species around 1680. About half a century later, Carl von Linné outlined his classification of species in Systema Naturae. Early on, most people assumed that species, a species was born once and for all. Those that existed would not disappear and new ones would not arrive. Linné, for instance, was only interested in existing species, the idyllic nature he observed during the 18th century, as if prehistory did not matter or was non-existent. We will never believe, he boldly claimed, that a species could totally vanish from Earth. Interesting. <laughs> Species or kinds of animals that were no longer in sight, it was assumed, were simply lost or hiding someplace else, which was the view of the Icelandic fishermen. It wasn't until the 18th, until the Enlightenment, especially the, uh, with the work of uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant, that these ideas were subsided. Kant argued that morality and ideas about justice were human constructions, not parts of the natural world. Theoretically, at least, species might become obsolete. French zoologist Georges Cuvier raised the controversial idea during the turmoil of the French Revolution that some, animals, some animal kinds had disappeared for good. His ideas were supported by the work of British collector Mary Anning, which opened a new window into the past by the discovery of fossils. An old seabed with layers of bizarre fossils, one of them is on the image. Uh, an old seabed with layers of bizarre fossils had been pushed up above sea level along the Jurassic coast of South England, exposing the fossils to curious naturalists like Anning. The fossils proved to be 100 million years old one of them na was named Ichthyosaur, the remains of marine reptiles that were later frequently discussed in detail. This would invite new questions about the prehistory and extinction of animals. Similar findings from caves in southern Germany helped. German anatomist Johann Christian Rosenmüller reasoned that large fossilized bones discovered in the caves were those of in an ancient beer, different from any animal known at the time. The beer had once lived, but was now extinct. British biologists Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace took over where Anning, Cuvier and Rosenmüller left, demonstrating that life had a much longer history than previously thought, and moreover, that it was continually changing thanks to the fundamental role of natural selection. Each species had to have evolved from something pre-existing. Although knowledge of extinction had prompted Darwin to speculate about biological variation and natural selection, he rarely mentioned extinction in his extensive work on the origin of species. For him, extinction was inevitable and taken for granted. The competition of life forms necessarily pushed some forms aside as one thing led to another in the continuous unfolding of life. The history of the Earth and, and the zoological kingdom merged together in slow motion, in deep time in modern terms. Species had evolved and disappeared in the distant past, perhaps for millions of years, long before humans arrived. Some people, however, assumed some extinctions occurred during certain catastrophic events. Darwin and most of his contemporaries, in other words, were not interested in extinction in the present. Darwin and Newton became kind of friends and uh, exchanged letters, and here is one of Darwin's letters to uh, 
Newton. It's a polite letter, and Darwin is embar embarrassed. He is asked to uh, recommend Newton for a new job in zoology in Cambridge, and he uh, has to tell his friend Newton that he's unable to do this, as he wouldn't be the right guy for the job. Their friendship maintained despite this. Arguably, uh, Alfred Newton, the ornith ornithologist, the first professor of zoology at Cambridge, who got a job despite everything, played a key role in establishing the modern concept of extinction as a topic for research and policy, paving the way for animal protection. He was keen to draw lessons from the sad fate of the great dog, which re remained his main concern to the end of his life. Newton's trick was to make a clear distinction between natural extinction, which concerned Darwin, and unnatural extinction faced by the great dog and many other species at the middle of the 19th century, ongoing extinctions caused by humans. Thus, Newton was able to brush aside Darwin's fatalism, which suggested that things simply unfolded on their own, hammering home the point that it was necessary to take direct action to slow down or avert extinction wherever possible. In doing so, he opened a space for environmental expertise and the possibility of saving rare species on the brink of extinction. Zoology and natural science, he reasoned, would play central roles in the future, beyond, if not above, in Newton's view, the reach of lay persons and politicians. Extinction through human intervention was avoidable and unnatural. News about the fate of the Great Dog, which reached Britain with Newton's return from Iceland in late summer in 1858, struck a new chord at an important moment in time when the theory of, ev of evolution by natural selection was gaining force. Extinction became a revered and appealing topic, no longer limited to prehistoric time and natural forces in the classical understanding, but happening here and now. Newton's worries about the extinction of the great dog would generally generate public support for the protection of species, drawing attention to the damaging impact of humans on the natural habitat and the necessity of halting or reverting the damage. Ideas of extin extinction then changed with the great dog. While ideas of biological evolution had been around in the academic world since 18th century, Newton probably didn't pay attention to them. Generally, he was not drawn to heavy theory. But when Darwin and Newton launched the theory of evolution by natural selection, he made an exception and was immediately ca captivated. This is from his biography and a letter he wrote. Not many days after my return home, there reads me the part of the Journal of the Linnean Society, which contains the papers by Mr. Darwin and Mr. Wallace. I sat up late that night to read it, and never shall I forget the impression it made on me. Herein was contained a perfect, simple solution of all the difficulties which had been troubling me for months past. Ten years after the publication of Darwin's Orig Origin of Species, Newton argued in an article published in the first issue of Nature, I think, that the, color, the coloring of birds' eggs was the result of natural selection. It seems likely that Darwin and Newton discussed the case of the great dog at some point. They met and exchanged a series of letters. Newton must have raised the issue of the extinction, but none of the letters indicate this was the case. In any case, extinction had hardly arrived as an epistemic object or a biological theme, although the English term had been around since at least the 14th century, and Darwin's interest was limited to deep time, not the Victorian age. As a result, Darwin's ideas, perhaps, have less relevance for the current age of mass extinction than one might think. His world view was a static one, it was later argued, unfit for a world of rapid change. Alfred Newton, on the other hand, is being reborn for the purpose of addressing escalating human impact on the living system of the planet. Although Newton would basically collect bird specimens, classifying and recording them in the fashion of the Victorian age, he went much further. 
treading new and important grounds. It is no small irony, as historian of science Henry Cowles argues, that the man who set extinction on the modern agenda remains more or less unknown outside the narrow circle of bird enthusiasts. It's even more ironic if one keeps in mind that Darwin refused to support his application for professorship in Cambridge. Newton's approach was controversial, partly because it challenged dominant ideas at the time about detachment and neutrality. But with new legal frameworks about the protection of species, which Newton himself held pioneer, a concern later associated with biological diversity, his voice eventually found resonance and respect. Similar ideas about extinction and the need for protection were proposed in the United States at the time by environmentalist George Perkins Mars, who warned against the damaging effects of human activities in his book, Man and Nature. Homo sapiens is not exempt from the prospect of mass extinction. Linne granted Homo sapiens a place in his grand classificatory scheme in 1758. French philosopher Denis Diderot suggested a little later that Homo sapiens would probably become extinct at some point, but the species suggest he suggested would undoubtedly appear, reappear in a different era. Italian writer Giacomo Le Leopardi maintained in 1836, around the time of the disappearance of the great dog, that if the human species were to leave, the earth would not miss a thing. The question of human loss is increasingly on the agenda. Will anyone miss us? Does it matter if no one is around to narrate the history of life once we are gone? In 1830, a cartoonist illustrator, geologist, Henri de la Bec, joked about cyclical notions of history, reappearing species, and the end of humans. Homo sapiens were only to be seen as fossils and Ichthyosaur had appeared again. Here, Ichthyosaurus is alive. Uh, and all over the place, while the ground is littered with fossilized human remains. And this uh, image keeps being recycled nowadays for obvious reasons. Was the advancing death of humans a tragedy or for the good? Such questions and concerns are no longer considered science fiction. No doubt they will be increasingly pressing in the near future. And that brings me to rethinking extinction, the third part of my piece. And uh, here I have a slide from, uh, this is uh, a famous site from South Iceland, uh, the last uh, booming population of great oaks was on this island, and this is a, uh, a 17th century image showing two boats appearing at the island or the skerry, and, uh, and uh, a few hunters are up there hunting for dozens of, of great oaks. And, Interestingly, this scary uh, became extinct in a volcanic eruption in 1830, so it disappeared, and uh, the breeding population of the great dog had to move, move to Elte, which I showed you before. So it's an in interesting combination of natural and human forces in the 19th century. Mass extinction has become a major concern internationally. In the Anthropocene, geologic history and human history have fundamentally collapsed to the extent that one can no longer speak about the planet itself. Nature and culture, separated for centuries in all kinds of modernist projects, finally collide, echoing ancient times and traditions. While Alfred Newton's distinction between unavoidable natural extinction and man-made extinction, as it was called, shared this time rather well, encouraging people to meaningfully act to threats of extinction and to set rules, it now needs radical rethinking. 
Such rethinking needs to constantly acknowledge that current environmental hazards are unprecedented, new kinds and on new scales, as humans have become a geological force. Increasingly, even volcanic eruptions and earthquakes are generated by human activities, among them the melting of glaciers and fracking or, or, or deep drilling. The Anthropocene threat is to become self -inflected, a self-inflected holocaust and managed to life and mass at the invitation of humans. It is not as surprising that extinction studies, so-called, are taking on as an interdisciplinary field exploring the current meaning of extinction, its appearance in different contexts, and the future prospects for all kinds of extinction rebellion, political, practical, and theoretical. One of the contributions of extinction studies so far is to uproot the genealogical tree, so to speak. One of the central ideas of Darwinian and neo-Darwinian theory, uh, yeah, the problem with the tree imagery is that it presents organisms and species as isolated phenomena linked only to predecessors through vertical lineages, back to the origin of life. Such an image does not capture the essence of extinction. Armed with development systems theory and related frameworks, several scholars have emphasized horizontal relations across species in the un unfolding of life and extinction. Each organism, it is argued, in various theoretical vocabulary, is an ensemble of biosocial relations maintained and developed in both contemporary and historical encounters. Species in this light do not appear with a single event. They renew themselves with every new generation through the solidarity and mutual care of individuals and collectives and the shelter and nourishment offered by their habitat. Nor is extinction a single event signified by the death of the last organism. It is embedded in an extensive relation and network, a process with a long history and a series of significant consequences. Every attempt to battle extinction should attend to the advent and aftermath of extinction, to connections and context and potential tipping points. The extinction of the great dog really began in the slaughterhouse of Funk Island, Newfoundland, during the 17th century, not in Iceland in June 1844. Species, it is now argued, can become practically extinct long before the last organisms disappear. Many species are on the waiting list for a period in intensive care in zoos, protected zones or laboratories, on the death zone, anticipating the unavoidable, as the late Australian-American anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose argued. It may also be argued that the extinction process extends far beyond the death of the last organism, fading away over time beyond death as living beings somehow remain alive in the relations and memory of others that survive. Could a species that has gone somehow be reclaimed or resurrected? Charles Darwin emphasized that a species could not return. This is the origins again. We can clearly understand why a species once lost should never reappear, even if the very same conditions of life, organic and inorganic, would recur. Groups of species follow the same general rules in appearance and disappearance. A group does not reappear after it has once disappeared. This has often sounded a self-evident uh, self conclusion. It may sound surprising that Darwin even bothered to mention such a thing, but perhaps it was worth spelling out the obvious at a time when the idea of extinction had hardly been fleshed out. Lyell, a friend of Darwin, maintained in 1830 that its teosaur, which Anning had discovered among other fossils, might bring back to life, might spring back to life again. Might Alka in Penis be resurrected? In 2015, a group of genetic scholars and bird enthusiasts, about 20 people, met in Newcastle, England to discuss the possibility of resurrecting the great dog. The reason the main milestones of such a project would be 
The mapping of the genome of the great dog and its editing by inserting key parts of the genome into a living cell of a related bird species. Eventually, they might be able to produce a kind of substitute great dog and release it into the wild. Not much has been heard from the great dog group since this historic meeting. Probably the reconstruction of a species turned out to be more complicated technically and ethically than anticipated. Um, extinction studies, I mentioned that. Uh, and uh, here are some of three important sources. Tom van Doren on uh, flightways and, and Deborah Bird Rose. Uh, it's worth looking at. Given a developmental systems or biosocial becomings perspective, the resurrection of an extinct species is far more complex than simple cloning or genetic reconstruction. A genuine reconstruction would have to reconstruct an entire relational field across species, biosocial embodiments and ways of life, a crazy project. What disappears with extinction it is not just the, organisms in the, the organism in the narrow understanding of the term. While organisms have a protective skin, it is not self-evident where its boundary lies and where the environment begins. The environment is part of the organism and the environment is part uh, is part of the organism. The microbiomes in our guts are a case in point, the environment within us. When an organism dies, therefore, part of the environment dies. As anthropologist, philosopher Tom van Doren puts it, something important and profound took place with the death of these last individuals. He studied, and yet the immensity and significance of extinction cannot be captured within these singular events, as though a species might be deemed to be extinct or not, solely on the basis of the presence of the world in the world of the last uh, one individual of the kind or lineage. This understanding reduces species to specimens, reified representatives of a type in a museum of life in a way that fails to acknowledge their entangled complexity. American literary scholar Carrie Wolf asks, when an entire species become extinct, what leaves the world? What world are we left with? Extinction, for one thing, he emphasizes, is never a generic event. Some extinctions, the fate of the passenger pigeon is a case in point, were driven by a came combination of technological invitations and discoveries, including the rifle, the railroad, and the telegraph, all of which made the bird more easily located and accessible for hunters. The great oak, of course, was primarily exterminated through long distance voyaging and, and the discovery of the new world. Its extinction was almost in plain sight by the end of the 17th century. The species lived on a death zone until 1844, possibly longer. And to conclude, the great dog remains one of the dodos and dinosaurs of our time, a symbol for extinction. Now it's back on the agenda on new terms due to the environmental disaster the planet is facing. If, as Walter ben Benjamin argued, allegories are in the realm of thoughts, what the ruins are in the realm of things. Allegories are in the realm of thoughts, what the ruins are in the realm of things. And, and this is a quote from Elizabeth's, uh, Elizabeth de Lofre's new book, Allegories of the Anthropocene, an important book. Uh, when a species disappears, it is not simply reduced biological diversity that bothers humans. Many people find stories of the death of the last organisms deeply touching. Sometimes they weigh like nightmare, nightmares on the brains of the living, raising pressing questions. In a very real sense, the continued presence of the great dog testified to our sense of loss. What is lost is ways of living with a very long history 
extensive relations and networks, an entire nature culture complex, if you like. Van Doren thinks with the crowds he has studied. Uh, but if the death of a single crow signals here lies danger, danger uh, significant enough to avoid a place for years, to alter flightways and daily foraging routes, then what must the death of a whole species of crow, alongside a host of others at this time, communicate to any sentient and attentive observer? What could these distinctions not announce? How could these distinctions not announce our need to find new flightways, new modes of living in a fragile and changing world? Nowadays, the signatures of human activities are manifest as spikes in geological reckoning throughout the planet, across plates and continents, from the minute world of organism to geological strata. The presence of plastic waste in the oceans being one example. The decisive challenge of the politics of life in the face of global warming, melting glaciers and weather extremes is to avert total disaster. One theoretical avenue is to draw upon lively th the lively theorizing on the Holocaust of the last century, integrating classic perspectives on life itself and the recent notions of flightways, death zones, and processes of extinction. Meaningful biopolitics for the current age necessitates deep understanding of endangered lives and environments and a plan as to what to prioritize and how to act. Perhaps it's fair that the great dog has the final word here. Not only do people speculate about the genetic re reconstruction of the great dog, also, there are attempts to bring back its voice. Homer, the legendary Greek author, not the Simpson guy, reasoned ages ago that birds were winged words, carrying messages of one kind to another. It's an intriguing metaphor. Birds are winged words. And if they are wingless, what messages have they got? What would the great dog have to say to us? German artist Wolfgang Müller, a long-time bird enthusiast, had the idea of capturing the voices of extinct birds, including that of the great dog, and make them available for radio broadcasting. Müller was invited for an art exhibit in Iceland in 1991, and soon after the bird somehow came to him. Drawing upon available knowledge about the calls of related Alka species, he asked a well-known Icelandic actress, Chris Björk Kelt, to embody the voice of the great dog. Chris Björk agreed, trying to imitate the sound from the deep throat of the great dog, perhaps as it flips its small wings, and now it's available on the internet under the title of Seans Vosibus Avium for anyone who wants to listen and digest the message. I suggest we listen. Seance vocibus avium. Seance vocibus avium. Liebe Herren, es ist an der Zeit, sich auch von Ihnen zu verabschieden. Ich bedanke mich für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Tag. Sie hörten ein Hörspiel von Wolfgang Müller. Er schrieb den Text und führte Regie. And on behalf of the great dog and myself, I want to thank you. Yeah.